Uh, one thing I know about all the parents in this room and those who want to be parents one day, uh, you want to raise children who are healthy. Uh, you want to raise children who are confident. You want to raise children who are full of life, who uh, have strong character and love God. We all want that for our children. Uh, but we live in a day with so much advice on parenting that parents seem to be pushed in one of two extreme directions that are concerning at best and destructive at worst. Uh, some parents want to control every aspect of their, their child's life and protect them from uh, reality and culture and media, anything in the world. Uh, other parents want to be their kids' friends so bad that they don't control anything and they just let their kids do whatever they want. A friend of mine told me uh, that he heard a dad of a newborn, maybe a, a three-month-old, say, when our baby cries, we never go into his room. We go in there when we say it's time to go in his room, not when he wants us to come. Because if you start catering to their whining now, you reinforce their manipulative behavior. This is a cry of an egocentric, sinful narcissist, and we have to break his will. Like, this is a three-month-old crying infant, and that's what the dad said. On the other hand, I was at a restaurant recently where a five-year-old is screaming at the top of his lungs, and the parents aren't doing anything to correct that behavior. His parents didn't say a word. His parents didn't say a thing. Like, everyone in the restaurant wanted to uh, discipline that child, except for the parents. Um, I've seen families where children are never allowed to watch TV, ever. Um, and when they go to their friend's house, they watch TV like they're heroin addicts. And I've seen other families where everyone in the family has a TV in their bedroom, and so there are like six TVs in the house, and there's no supervision, no limits, no restrictions on one kid, what kids watch. I think we desperately need wisdom from God on parenting so that we can all just drive a stake in the ground and say, this is how I'm going to parent. And with God's help, I'm going to raise my children in a way that honors God. So today, I want to talk about some character issues. I want to look at some key values and attitudes that I want to instill in my children before they leave our home. And I need to tell you up front, I'm not an expert at parenting. I used to be an expert at parenting, and then I had children. Uh, parenting was easy when we had pets. You know, you could just squirt them with a squirt bottle if they need discipline. Now, I know that when I talk about parenting and how to raise kids, you're going to watch my kids, right? And you're going to be like, yeah, you don't really know what you're talking about, do you? So I'm not an expert on parenting. I have a 13-year-old daughter, I have a 9-year-old daughter, and I have an 8-year-old son. Uh, I'm very aware of the imperfections that I have as a dad. Uh, what I'm going to share with you comes straight from the Bible. There are values that come right out of the Bible. Uh, these values are written about very directly by the writers of Scripture. And as we walk through them, I want to encourage you uh, to write them down. Uh, I'll tell you why. I'm going to uh, want you to do that in just a moment. But so here are the values that I want uh, for my kids. I want them engraved on their hearts before they leave our house. The first one is gratitude. I want my children to be thankful and appreciative um, of everything that they have so that one day they become generous people. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes about this, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, part of the problem we face is, is that much of our culture and most of our economy is built on making people feel entitled to what they want uh, that they don't already have. Like, we're, our, our society is built on this. A little girl in church said to her dad, if God wants me to be happy all the time, why doesn't he just give me everything I want? I mean, you think about this. If you want to develop a child with the capacity for gratitude, is it a good parenting strategy to make sure they get everything they want? Is that a good idea? In the short term, getting what you want will produce moments of gratification, so it may seem like a good thing, but in the long run, if I always gratify every desire, I will, it will inevitably lead to selfishness and a sense of entitlement, and it will destroy the very capacity of gratitude that I want so much to build into my children. A psychologist writes that this sense of entitlement in our culture has gotten so strong that it's led to a proliferation of lawsuits. 
because people know when I, Lord, I don't get what I want, I can just sue somebody. These things have actually happened. He writes about them. A Pennsylvania nursing student failed a, couple, uh, failed a course twice and sued the school for not helping with her anxiety. A Florida woman sued FedEx because she tripped over the package that was left on her doorstep. A psychic was awarded, so she didn't just sue, but she was awarded $986,000 when a doctor's CT scan impaired her psychic abilities. Now my question is, shouldn't she have known not to go to the doctor in the first place? <laughs> we live in a day when lawsuits like this are epidemic. Character qualities like gratitude and appreciation and generosity of spirit will never be developed in a child if the parent thinks that it's his or her job to make sure that the child's desires get gratified. Um, that's not your job. Parents who are too busy often feel guilty about their busyness, and so they try to compensate by giving more money or more things to their kids. Um, and that's a deadly combination. We're raising a generation that's wrestling what's, co what's called enriched deprivation. Kids are given way too much stuff that they don't need and that's not good for them and not nearly enough of what they desperately need. Now we have to teach our kids wisely about this. Some time ago, one of my kids wanted something uh, you know, from the store and financially, I could have said yes. Uh, it wouldn't have been a big stretch financially but it would not have been a good thing for my child's character development. It would not have reinforced the right stuff. And what was interesting in this moment for me was the biggest barrier to saying no was that I knew that if I said yes, I would be a hero for a moment. And I love to give to my kids. Uh, not because I'm altruistic, but because when I do, I get this burst of gratitude and joy. And who doesn't want that? Like, who doesn't want to be Santa Claus? So saying no to my child meant also saying no to me. But I have to put the long-term character development of my kids ahead of my own short-term gratification. Another problem in this category that I hear from parents is that kids will ask for something that costs some money, and parents will say, I can't afford it. Now, if the kid is smart at all, he'll say, you know, you know he'll start to argue with you about this, that you really can't afford it because you can go without food or shelter or things like that. Um, usually the issue is not, I can't afford it. The issue is not that I don't have the money in the bank. Usually it's not about affordability. The issue is I'm choosing not to buy something for you and I'm choosing this for a very good reason. Because what I prize most and desire most for my children, far more than any particular thing, is the development of really good character and real grateful hearts and the capacity to go through life with this sense of wonder and appreciation and not to be a slave to the spirit of entitlement that's a plague in our day. Uh, the issue is the development of character, not financial affordability. Parents, we have got to be utterly clear and un unapologetic about this. And of course, it's not going to feel good in the moment, it never does. But I have to ask questions like, is this child developing a good work ethic, appropriate to their age? Do they have appropriate chores around the house and are those being monitored well? Am I monitoring those? Uh, is this child increasingly more characterized by a sense of gratitude or by a sense of entitlement? Is this child growing in servanthood? Uh, do they notice and serve uh, the needs of the people around them. And sometimes that is the toughest in the home. I understand that. Uh, but I want to have this engraved on my children's hearts. Uh, I want them to have the capacity to go through life as grateful people because to go through life with this sense of entitlement is just a miserable way to live. And it's not God's will for any human being. All right, second value that's real important is responsibility. I want my children to take responsibility for their own lives. Uh, at birth, the dependency factor for a human being is 100%, and the responsibility factor is zero. As a parent, my goal is to help the dependency factor go down and to help the responsibility factor go up. And I have to think a lot about that. 
I've got to be asking myself, what kind of messages are my kids receiving from other sources about the need for them to take responsibility of their own lives? When my daughters were um, at the age where they loved princess stories, uh, we read a lot of princess stories. We watched a lot of princess movies. Uh, one day when I was reading Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs with them, I realized this is a horrible model for my daughters to be hearing. Like, here's a woman hiding from her stepmother because she feels helpless and afraid. She takes a job doing menial labor for seven short, cranky guys because she's afraid she could never find more fulfilling work. And she's sitting around passively waiting to be rescued by someone, singing, someday my prince will come. And I want my daughters to know, like, don't ever do that. <laughs> like, if you're ever in this situation, you confront your stepmother, like, head on. Like, tell her to come to grips with the aging process. Like, tell her that you have no intention to be, like, the fall guy for her neurotic insecurities about fading sexual attractiveness. Tell her to get a good therapist. And tell the seven short, cranky guys to get a life. Like, if they can't handle basic challenges of personal hygiene and housekeeping, for crying out loud, they have to find some other codependent to enable their domestic passivity. And stop waiting for some prince to come and rescue you. Like, build good relationships, like, serve people, do meaningful work. And when it comes time to find a prince, let daddy decide who's that prin who that prince is going to be. <laughs> you know, when children don't learn and develop responsibility, they become handicapped. When they develop responsibility, they learn how to do life. They learn how to solve problems. And Paul writes about this in Galatians 6, 5. So the church at Galatia, he says... Each of you should carry your own load. Like each of us needs to take responsibility for our own life or we're going to be miserable. Uh, parents, you can't wait until your child is 18 to start teaching this. Um, I want to share with you an example that will often occur in parenting. A child will say to a parent, I'm bored. And often what will happen when a child says, I'm bored, is that a parent will attempt to solve that, uh, attempt to solve that problem. And so, for instance, you might start generating ideas. You know, well, why don't you go outside and play? Like, no, it's too boring. Well, why don't you go to a friend's house? Like, no, no one's home. And then the parent takes that as their responsibility to just keep pitching ideas, you know? Like, well, why don't you draw a picture? Why don't you write a letter? Why don't you do a science experiment? Why don't you memorize a chapter of the Bible? Why don't you read War and Peace? And the kid's like, no, no, no. What else you got? Well, if you just keep pitching ideas to them, the kid will keep hitting them out. And what's the child learning in this? The child's learning my boredom problem is your problem. It's your job to keep me entertained. And if that's what they learn, they're going to go through their life waiting for someone else to come along and make their life interesting or fulfilling or easier or more comfortable or more workable. And that's just a miserable way to live. On the boredom deal, the correct response, if a kid comes to you with that one, is to say, you know, boredom's a real problem. And I'm confident that you're going to be able to come up with a really good solution. And then you walk away. And you walk away because you need your kids to learn that it's their life. Now, again, you're starting at zero on the responsibility factor. So you have to gauge it appropriately for whatever their age is. But man, that responsibility ought to be going up over the course of the years. I see parents who take responsibility for all their kids' difficulties, all their kids' problems and questions and concerns. And someday, when that kid is 18 or 22 or whenever it is that they leave, uh, they're going to be in for a rude awakening if parents haven't taught them what Paul taught the church a couple thousand years ago, each should carry his or her own load. All right, the next value that I hope to engrave real deeply in my kids is self-control. And this is the capacity to set aside immediate gratification of personal desires for the sake of long-term good. In Galatians 5, Paul talks about this as well. Uh, to the same church at Galatia, he talks about what's called the fruit of the Spirit. And these are indicators of uh, the fruit that God's spirit is at work in someone's life. So he has a list of nine of them. Uh, the final one, he says, is self-control. An indication that God is at work in someone's life is that they're no longer a victim at the mercy of whatever impulse grabs them. 
Now, this is not true when they first enter into this world. When a human being is born, he or she has a bundle of appetites and impulses. A hungry child wants to be fed. A scared child wants to be held. A hurt child wants to hurt someone back. And these tendencies don't go away by themselves. Someone needs to set boundaries. Someone needs to teach a child, here are the acceptable ways that you can deal with these impulses, and here are the unacceptable ways. And here are the consequences if you engage in behavior that is unacceptable. These are the boundaries. And when children cross over the boundaries, and they will cross over the boundaries, that's part of a child's job. Like, part of the way they learn is to test limits and the cross boundaries. So when they do that, when they cross over the boundaries, part of the parent's job is to provide an appropriate level of discomfort or problems so that the child starts to know and internalize those boundaries. And when they struggle with this, when they just want to give vent to their impulse, and they will, it's not enough just to say no. Parents have to help the child to find ways to deal with those impulses and emotions and feelings and desires. Let me give you an example. Uh, video game usage. Uh, we can help kids develop self-control by giving them the opportunity to set their own limits when it comes to video game usage. Uh, brain science teaches us that kids who spend more than 30 minutes a day playing video games are actually doing damage to their brain growth and development. Um, that explains a lot for some of our kids, doesn't it? Uh, kids who spend a lot of time doing, they become doers. Kids who spend a lot of time watching, they become watchers. Um, that's just how the brain grows. And so knowing this, my wife and I have decided to limit video game usage for our kids to three hours a week. Um, the way that we help them develop self-control is by allowing them to decide when they want to use that three hours. Um, our kids have Nintendo Switch, and we're able to monitor their usage by using the N Nintendo Switch app. It's fairly easy to keep track of their time. And so they don't have to ask us if they can play video games. Um, they know they have three hours a week. They know they can use those three hours whenever they want, however they want. The only stipulation is it can't interfere with their homework, uh, dinner time, or bedtime. Um, they can choose also to go over their allotted three hours if they want, but it's going to cost them twice as much time the following week. Um, last week, one of our kids actually had a friend over, and they were playing video games, and she decided that she wanted to go over an hour and a half, that it was worth spending that hour and a half with her friend playing the video games to, uh, that would cost her three hours this week. So she's not playing video games this week. Um, and that was fine with us because that was her decision. Uh, what we don't have in our house is conversations about playing video games. Um, our kids don't have to ask us if they can play video games. We're not constantly saying no to our kids about playing video games. And they're developing self-control. Um, because they have to decide. Like, if they want to be able to play video games every day, they need to restrict our time to 30 minutes a day. Um, just a side note here, if you find yourself saying no to your kids a lot about the same thing, that's probably an indication that you need to help your kids develop self-control in an area of their life. We do this with treats as well. Uh, a treat for us is anything that has a lot of sugar in it. So desserts, ice cream, candy, or even soda. Our kids have four treats that they can use anytime they want throughout the week. Um, they can eat all four treats on Monday if they want to. They can eat all four treats in one sitting and get sick if they want to. Uh, it's their decision. We need to help our kids develop self-control. Uh, and it's so important that we get this right because our kids will need these skills when they're making choices with regard to car use and substance abuse and sexual activity when they're in their teenage years. And they'll need these skills when they're on their own in college so they don't flunk out of school because they can't control their video game use at that point. Let me give you another, another example. Anger. Uh, and this is huge. Uh, I would say this single impulsive issue will mean more problems probably than anything else. And the writers of scripture have a lot to say about anger. This is from Proverbs 16:32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. It's a remarkable statement. Who's a hero? 
You look at our society, like who's a hero in our society? You look at movies in our society, who are they? Hobbs and Shaw, The Rock, right? I mean, like he's the hero, right? Or Jason Bourne. Like these are not poster boys for anger management. Like our movies are mostly anger or angry heroes chasing after angry villains. The writer of scriptures say, you put a great warrior who can capture a city on one side and a person who's developed patience and can deal with the anger on the other side, and you ask who the hero is, it's like no contest. Taming a hostile city is nothing compared to taming a hostile spirit. The true hero is the one who can subdue and rule over his or her own temper. That's true heroism. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4.26, in your anger, do not sin. In other words, it's possible to experience anger, but not to sin in the expression of it. But it's also very difficult because this is such explosive stuff. Uh, Another statement about anger that's relatively specific to parents. Uh, In the first century, almost all authority resided in the father, so we could include moms in this statement also. Colossians 3.21, fathers, do not exasperate your children, so they will not lose heart. Or it could be translated, don't provoke them to wrath. Don't trip them up in this whole anger category. Now, it's not uncommon for there to be a couple of times in a child's life when anger issues kind of spike in their life. A child is born, and fairly soon, around the age of two or so, these issues, you know, temper tantrums, and so on will sometimes uh, start to surface. That's why we call them the terrible twos. Um, A two-year-old has a favorite word. What is it? No. Actually, next to mine. Probably the the two are up there, right? And often this is not the parent's favorite word when the child is actually going through this. Um, But I want to tell you something. The development of a strong no is very important to the growth of a human being. Because the day is going to come when where they're, where they're going to actually need a very strong no. When someone offers them drugs. When an older boyfriend starts pressuring his teenage girlfriend, you know, if you really love me, you'll get involved sexually because that's just what people do when they're in love. When they get their first job and someone tries to get them to cut ethical corners. When someone else tries to dominate or manipulate them. All through your life, your kids are going, my kids are going to need to develop a very strong no. And so when they're real little, we have to help them with that. Um, Now, sometimes they may say no in inappropriate ways, but we have to deal with that. Uh, Sometimes it's going to, you know, someone's going to ask a question, and they can say no to that question, and that's got to be okay. Um, You have to actually set it up sometimes. You know, say you're having dinner together. Say something goofy like, can I eat some of your dessert? And just let them say no. Like, let them say it's strong and just let it be okay. And don't eat their dessert. It's a good thing for a human being to say no. It's a good thing. And that could be real uh, counterintuitive for parents. Again, it needs to be uh, managed well. You have to put limits on it, but you have to help them develop a really good, strong no. So around the age of two, anger issues tend to surface in a way that they weren't before. Um, they normally last a year or so, a little longer, a little shorter, something like that. And generally, they uh, begin to calm down. And then again, anger anger issues tend to spike somewhere around the age of 11, 12, 13 or so. And how long does that era tend to last? About 30 years or so. (laughs) No, it comes down again. But I want to say something about what's going on, because there's very interesting research in this area. Uh, There are enormous, not just physiological and hormonal, but neurological changes that human beings are going through in this whole adolescent era. Uh, there's an award-winning book by uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Bradley. He, he discusses a 10-year study that he did at UCLA. It involves uh, neurologists using MRIs to study thousands of kids, uh, the development of the brain between the ages of 3 and 18. And there's some very interesting uh, stuff that he's found. And what he wrote is this, what the researchers found was astonishing and completely rewrote our understanding of the adolescent brain. Previously, neurologists believed that the human brain was essentially formed by the age of five. They used to think that once a kid was five, that the brain was about done. Now they discovered that the prefrontal cortex, which is the home of emotional control, impulse restraint, rational decision making, so the prefrontal cortex does not Uh, do the bulk of its maturation until between the ages of 13 and 20. 
So that's when the brain is still, to a large extent, being formed in the most sensitive and adult ways. In other words, Bradley writes, and I'm quoting him directly now, what used to be a sad, quiet joke between mom and dad is now being accepted more as neurological fact. Adolescents are temporarily brain damaged. That's what he writes. Now, that doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean any of that. I mean, I mean they're wonderful. It's like exciting to be around them. They're life-giving at that age. What it means is there's a real good neurological reason why the adolescent stage will often be this enormous mood swing stage. And there are like radical inconsistencies. At one time you think you're talking to a child, at one time you're thinking, you think you're talking to an adult. And there will be what appear to be multiple personalities going on in the same body. And there's real good reason for that. And it will require patience on the part of parents because these are things going on in their bodies and neurologically that just haven't been finished yet. So with all that this is going on as a parent, um, can you allow your kids to get mad? Like, should you get kids get mad? Should they get mad at you? Should they get mad at their friends? Yeah, they should. Um, it's a critical part of growing up. Every time there's an argument or a conflict between me and one of my children, it's an opportunity for me to teach my kids about anger management. It's an important moment. And when they get it right, when they actually handle their anger or respond uh, in appropriate ways, uh, we need to, as parents, when they do like what Paul says, be angry and don't sin, we need to affirm them in that. You've got to come back to them sometime and say, you know, when everything's calmed down, like you did a really good job of managing your anger in that. Um, any of you ever say something that makes one of your teenage kids roll their eyes? Kids at that age are professional roll, uh, eye rollers. Uh, well, if instead of doing that, at some point you're having a conversation with them and they don't roll their eyes, they look you straight in the eye and they stay in the room and they talk to you appropriately, directly, without you know, getting angry, you have to come back to them afterwards and say, you know, I'm really proud of the way that you handled that situation. Uh, we have to do that. Oftentimes, you know, when our kids do things, that make us feel good in obvious ways, you know, when they achieve something or they get good grades or something like that, that's an obvious time to affirm our kids. Very often kids go through their whole lives and when it comes to anger management, sometimes they do it horribly wrong. They mess up. But sometimes they get it right. And when they get it right, we don't say a word about it. We don't say anything about them getting it right. Too many parents get so caught up in winning arguments that they forget part of my job is to actually teach my kids how to manage anger appropriately in a God-honoring way. It's not just about me trying to impose my will and win an argument. So we need to praise them when they get it right. Do you ever let kids hit each other? I hope you don't. Uh, once children are verbal, once they're old enough to use and understand words, they need to learn that physical expressions of anger is not acceptable. It's just not. And we live in a world where exposure to violence is epidemic. And if that's going on in your house, I would say you need to get help about that. Um, whatever you need to do, you need, whatever you need to read, whatever counselor you need to visit, I'd say get help with that. Do you let your kids express anger in disrespectful ways? I hope you don't. You know, I'm in settings too often where kids will address their parents with a level of sarcasm or put downs or name calling or hostility or outright contempt that is just demeaning and it's appalling. And that goes on and parents say nothing, they don't stop it, they don't challenge it, they don't rebuke it, they don't correct it, it's unacceptable. As a parent, I don't want universal agreement from my kids. I want them to build a strong no, but as a parent, I want to demand consistent civility and courtesy and respect and honor. The writers of scripture say this is real clear, honor your father and mother. And so let's just at least set the bar there. And I need to coach my kids in this. If I want them to treat others respectfully, I need to treat them respectfully. I know this is sobering, but the single most important way that your kids are gonna learn about anger management is by watching you when you get angry. So during a conflict, especially with your kids, 
You can't afford to get into a shouting match. You can't afford to spew rage. You're the parent. If the temperature starts to get too high and you need to take a time out, take a time out. If they're starting to get out of control and they need to stop it, then you identify that and you stop the conversation. And you say, this is a real important subject. We're gonna continue it, but we're gonna come back to it and discuss it when we can do that in a calm, respectful way. You have to be the one to do that. They're not gonna be the one to do that. They're the child, you're the parent. One thing my wife says a lot is, I love you too much to argue with you. I love you too much to argue with you. Let's talk about this when you're not angry. Make it your goal to help your child manage this very powerful emotion of anger in a way that's honoring and pleasing to God and sets them up for a life of relational health when they leave your home. All right, the next attitude that I want to have real clear for my kids is humility. I want my kids to know that they are not perfect. Writing to the church at Rome, Paul says in Romans 12, 3, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. One of my daughters has difficulty telling the truth all the time. Uh, my wife and I will often talk to her about telling the truth and how important that is. One time she asked me, uh, Dad, do you, do you always tell the truth? And instinctively I responded, yes, Mommy and Daddy always tell the truth. Like I wanted her to know that she can follow my example of telling the truth. And it wasn't until later that I actually realized I'm violating this value that I want to instill in my kids. What I should have said is, of course not. I lie. Like sometimes I lie. Your mother lies, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> everyone I've ever known lies. Like every human being that's ever walked the face of the earth lies. The most famous story about lying in American history, George Washington cut down the cherry tree. His father asked, who cut down the tree? And George said, I cannot tell a lie. It was me. That was in a biography of Washington written by a guy named Parson Weems in 19th century. He made the story up. The most famous story about not lying in American history is a lie. Anybody who says they never lie, they're lying. So most of the time, mommy and daddy will tell the truth. But absolutely, we lie, and so do you. I need my children to know that I'm a sinner capable of really messing up, and they are too. Now, I want them also to know that they're worthy of being valued and celebrated and cherished and encouraged and loved, but they're not perfect, and neither am I. One reason why this is so important is that if I underemphasize my child's propensity to sin, if I pretend like there is no darkness in them, which can be tempting for me because it's just a whole lot more pleasant that way. But if I pretend like there's no darkness in them, they know there is. And inside, eventually, they're going to begin to think, if dad knew the truth about me, he wouldn't love me. And then they're going to learn how to hide. I have to help these children whom I love and want to cheer on to learn that the same sin and darkness that plagues the rest of this sorry world is part of their fallenness. And it's part of my fallenness too. And one of the best ways that you can teach your children that you are a fallen human being is by apologizing and asking for their forgiveness when you do something wrong because you will do something wrong. We all do. I was disciplining my kids recently for being disrespectful to their mom. And to be honest, I didn't do and say the best thing in that moment. And so I said things that I wish I wouldn't have said, that I shouldn't have said. And later I talked to them and I said, you know, sometimes I don't know the right thing to say to correct your behavior. Like, I want you to respect your mom. That's really important to me. But I don't want to hurt you in the process of helping you to learn that. So will you forgive me for what I said? Now, when you do this, like don't over-dramatize it, like don't make it a melodramatic thing. Just give a simple, sincere, heartfelt apology. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Maybe the single greatest way a child learns to say they're not perfect and actually grow in humility is when they have a parent who can appropriately confess and repent. I'll say one more thing here. Some of you probably need to do that today. Like there are some things going on in your life with your kids and there's something wrong between you and one of your children and you need to make it right. 
you need to make the decision right now that you're actually going to, your, you're going to go to your child today and you're going to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Some of you have adult children and you feel like you, you, know, you wish you could do a do-over in some area of your parenting. Well, this is the one thing that you could actually do today. You could call your child. You could say, hey, I'm sorry. I wish I could have done that differently. Well, these are the things that I want engraved on my child's hearts before they leave our house. And you have to decide on yours. And here's the assignment that I want to give you. Uh, If you're a parent and you're married, uh, do this with your spouse. Just take 10 minutes. Uh, If you're a single parent, and I know you face heroic challenges, um, but I'd invite you to just get together with a friend. So if you're married, get together with your spouse. If you're a single parent, get together with a friend and just spend 10 minutes on the next steps in your bulletin or look at those values and say, which ones of these do I really need to go after? Like, which ones of these do I really need to work on? And then just start pursuing those this week. All right, let me pray as the band comes to lead us in a closing song. God, we're so grateful for this uh, privilege that you've given us to be parents. And I pray that we would take that responsibility very seriously, that we would lean into your wisdom and your word, that we would uh, read as much as we can, that we would grow as much as we can in wisdom in this area so that we can grow our kids, raise our kids to be healthy, whole, integrated, responsible, humble, grateful adults. And if we're missing it, God, I pray that you would just by your spirit, convict us in those areas that we need to correct and help us to put in the work, help us to learn, help us to be uh, sensitive, understanding to our kids, but help us to do this with great courage and boldness as we try to raise kids that honor you. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.